Hello dear students and welcome to this class on John Hicks's to Autumn. So in the previous class we had compared the season of autumn with natural beauty and bounty and also established how autumn as a season blesses both the natural world and the human world. So before we move to another segment, which is the third segment of the book, today I would like to take you back to the very basics of romantic poetry. Now when we talk about the basics of romantic poetry, I am actually thinking at the background. Now romantic poetry has a twofold background. The first background of romantic poetry resides in the fact that romantic poetry is a product of the European phenomenon called enlightenment. Now you might think what is enlightenment? Now this is a question that has made the poet and the philosopher wonder and think. Now what is the issue over here? The issue is that there was a philosopher whose name was Immanuel Kant and Immanuel Kant wrote an essay. The name of the essay was What is Enlightenment? And in that essay Kant asks this proverbial question that what is enlightenment? What is the answer? Kant says that the spirit of enlightenment lies in two words. Two Latin words. The first word is sapere, the second word is aude. So sapere aude, S A P E R E sapere and A U D E aude. So what does sapere aude mean? What does sapere aude mean? Sapere aude basically refers to the very premise of the enlightenment factor. That is, dare to doubt, dare to question. Now, what do you question? What do you ask? That is, you ask the very basis of the philosophy of enlightenment. And what is the philosophy of enlightenment? Enlightenment believes in knowing yourself. So, it's self-knowledge. What does self-knowledge mean? The same thing was spoken about by our sages as well. When in Kinopanishad, the three vital questions are Koham, Kinaham, Keshaha. Who am I? From whom am I? For whom am I? And this vital question of knowing oneself is very much there in every culture, in every tradition. For instance, the French have a way of asking, you say, what do I know? And this, what do I know? The very uh, premise of questioning one's own knowledge is very important. So this very premise of knowing oneself is very important as a factor. Because you see, what do I know? also entails who am I? I am what I know. And if you think that I am exaggerating, then this was a question, this was a statement not made by some enlightenment critic, but by someone who was even earlier as a philosopher, whose name is René Descartes. Descartes, as early as 1530, said, I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am. And how do you know? By thinking, right? So this premise of knowing, of thinking, of being are intertwined. They are interconnected. Now, look, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, why am I saying this? Because one of the major things that happened with the Enlightenment was that the focus 
shifted from out there in here. So what does the outside mean? So imagine there is a picture. This is a picture of my great grandfather behind me. Now, for you this picture does not mean anything. But for me this picture is a part of my heredity. This picture is a part of who I am. From where I come. So, Oham, Kenaham, Keshaham, from whom I come. Who am I? For whom am I? From whom am I? So, these are the questions. Now, look, there is another strand of theory, of thinking, that led to the romantic movement. Now, although the event was political, that is the French Revolution, it was a political event. Let's be very frank. The French people were very unhappy with the Bourbon monarchy. So they took them out and they built their own government. The first democracy of the world. So as to say. Now, what happened was that with the Bourbon monarchy, the problems, uh, or even with the French Revolution, the problems did not end. They only had newer colors. Because in the next two years, uh, say 1789 was the year of French Revolution. 1790 and 1791 was called the years of the Red Terror because of so much bloodshed. There was so much bloodshed that people called it the era of Red Terror. So you can understand. But we are not interested with the political implications or the political ramifications. Of the French Revolution. So, what are we interested in? We are rather interested in the philosophical implications of the French Revolution. What were they? What were the philosophical underpinnings of the French Revolution that made it such an interesting impact on the English poetic scene, on the English romantic scene, so as to say? And the answer, my friends, is that there was a thinker whose name was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau had a book called Du Contra Social, The Social Contract. In this book, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said something very interesting. He said, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. We are all born free, but look, we are chained with our family, we are chained with our government, we are chained with our college, we are chained with the taxation system, we are chained with relationships, we are chained with friendships, we are chained with our mobile phone, we are chained with our laptop, we are chained with our buses, trams, cars, so on and so forth. So man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And this implication of, some, of man's freedom. Say you have gone to visit some countryside, some mountain, some sea. Take a deep breath. You feel free. Come back to the city. Come back to your home, your daily life. You feel chained. So man is born free. So only in nature is man free because man is a natural being. Man is a thinking being but even more so man is an emotional being let's take an example you are angry okay everybody has to tell you to have patience to be calm to think rationally but imagine you are calm you are thinking Nobody has to tell you that you have to be emotional. Why? Because Rousseau said that that is man's first nature to be emotional. Man is born emotional and only later does man pick up how to think. Alright. So what happens is that this exuberance of emotions, this is what matters to the romantics. And look, now we will return to Keats to see that how he doubts, how he questions and how he arrives at his own answers to know himself better. 
Where are the songs of spring? I, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too. While the barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful coil the small max moon among the river shallows, borne aloft to sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full grown lambs love bleed from hilly bone. Hedge spirit sing, and now with treble soft the red dress whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Now look, he asks one vital question, one foundational question. Where are the songs of spring? Hi, where are they? Spring has its own beauty. No one needs to tell you what is the beauty of spring, right? No one needs to remind you the beauty of spring. But autumn has its own beauty as well. The beauty of autumn lies in the bareness, in the barrenness, in what is left. On the one hand, there is the exuberance. On the other hand, there is calmness and in, in between this exuberance and the calm quiet youth resides the beauty of autumn now look where are the songs of spring where are they where are they you see autumn brings with it something which is very different and not everybody can enjoy the beauties and the bounties and the graces of autumn. And you are bound to ask, where are the songs of spring? Right? Where are they? Now, starting from Geoffrey Chaucer, who was called the father of English literature or the father of English poetry. Starting from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the first lines of Canterbury Tales are one that April with his shower sute had. Uh, Passed the roots of March, uh, had passed the drought of March to its root end. So basically, when April with its sweet showers had passed the droughts of March to its roots. So you see, what happens is starting from Chaucer to the modernist poets, spring has often been seen in different lights. Till the Victorian period, till Christina Georgina Rossetti, spring has been seen as spring sweet. Be it Virgil's eclogues, be it Spencer's eclogues, be it somebody else. Everybody has looked at spring from very different sweet angles. Although the modernists have a very different approach to spring, but let's not go into that. Because Keats is no modernist. But he laments the missing of the flavors of the songs of spring. And then he summarily dismisses this idea and says, think not of them. Let's not think about them. Yes, there are no songs of spring, but autumn has its own beauty. So there is a calm acknowledgement at the end of his life that autumn has its own beauty. Love has the music too. Autumn has also its own music, though it's different maybe less cadenced, more nuanced, but autumn has its own beauty. While the barred clouds bloom from the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. So barred clouds, if you look at the autumn clouds, they look like prison bars. There is a specific name to that kind of cloud. I have forgotten what is the name. It's a very difficult name to pronounce. So if you, even if you do not know the name of the cloud, it doesn't matter. So the barred clouds bloom the soft dying day. As if the clouds, they bloom in the day which is dying. So the day is coming to its end. The long day rains. And when the day is waning, 
as if the clouds are blooming like flowers, like nocturnal flowers, the clouds are blooming at the end of the day. And look, Keats's own life, the speaker's own life is coming to an end. But then he sees that his poetic capacities, his poetic uh, splendors are increasing, they are blooming, they are sprouting. And he is celebrating that. through this image of the bark clouds which are blooming at the end of a dying day. And then look, he says, and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. So it's twilight and the clouds are reflecting the fading sun and they have become of rosy color, of a reddish yellow, of a crimson color. And this light is being reflected on the stubble plains. What is stubble? Stubble is the, uh, the blunt end of the crop body. When the crop is cut, it's cut from, say, maybe two or three inches from the bottom, from the ground. So that little part which remains on the ground, that is called stubble. So since the reaping has been done, the stubbles remain on the field. And then he says that the clouds are showering rosy colors on that stubble plain. Try to close your eyes and imagine this scene, how beautiful it looks. Then in a wailful choir, the small max moon among the river sallows, holding a lot for singing or sinking as the light wind lifts up the eyes. Now look, gnat is a small insect which keeps on chirping and keeps calls that chirping morning because the day is coming to an end and because Keats's own life is coming to an end and as if nature is participating in the beauty of the end. You see, Rubindunath has a song Ache dukho, ache mrittu, birago dokhano lage, tobu o shanti, tobu anondo, tobu anondo jage. There is sadness, there is death, the loneliness, the sorrow, it kind of shatters you. Ache dukho, ache mrittu, biroho dokhano lage. Tobu o shanti, still there is peace. Tobu anundo, still there is joy. Tobu anundo jage, still there is an eternity. Tobu prana nitto dhara, hashe shurjo chandro tara. Still there is an incessant flow of life. Tobu prana nitto dhara. Hashi Shurja Chandra Tara. So the sun, the moon, the stars, they smile. Boshanto Nikunje Ashe Vichitra Rake. The spring comes to roost in a different tune. Ache Dukho Ache Mrittu Viraho Dhamma Rake. Tarungo Milae Jai, Tarungo Uthe. Kushumo Jhodiya Pade, Kushumo Pute. So the waves die down, newer waves arise. Tarunga milai jaye, tarunga uthe, kushumo chhodiya pade, kushumo phute. So the flowers, they wither and new flowers bloom. Nahi khayo, nahi shesho, nahi nahi doinu desho. Shri purna tarupaye munasthano mahi. So there is no end. There is no destruction. Nahi khaya, nahi shesh. Nahi nahi doino desh. There is no poverty over here. No hint of poverty over here. Shei purno tarupai mustamu. So my heart seeks its refuge at the feet of that wholeness. Of that completeness. Ache dukho, ache mrittu, birabodogunagi. 
go to youtube and listen to the song it's very beautiful and if you prefer oldies like me go and listen to the version of the guru to vishash you love it he has his own expressions which are beautiful or mohan singh he too is a great singer so in any case let's come back so the on the river stretch there is maybe a little field of grass and the mats are in there and they're chirping in the evening wind and the wind is rising and flowing like the ebbing flow of life the ebbing and flowing of life and their tunes are rising and fading along with the ebbing up and down of the wind and full grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bow and now look up till now we were looking at the river bed which was on the eye level and now he asks us to look upwards where full grown lambs are bleating from their hilly pen from the hilly enclosure and then he again asks us to come down and says hedge cricket sing and na and the hedge crickets hedge hedges are like uh, small reeds or thistles where crickets are singing they are chirping and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft so the robin red breast which is a bird it has a very beautiful melodious voice and it's singing from some garden so now again you are looking at a tree look you are looking upwards and then Suddenly, you are looking at the skies, and the gathering swallows twitter in the skies. So the swallows they are migrating. The swallows are migrating from the colder temperature to the warmer one. And look, just like the poet soon will be migrating from this world to another world. Now the gathering swallows twitter in the skies. This image is where Keats arrives at a poetic perfection. It's where the yin and the yang meet, the meet. It is where the purusha meets the prakriti. It is where the self meets with divinity. It is where the I meets the God. Remember that shlok: Asatoma satgamaya, tamasoma jyotirgamaya, mrityurma amrita gamaya, abhira dhirmaya soham. So over here he is at Soham. So um, he is. So now you see Keats always spoke about negative capability. What is negative capability? Let me try to explain. Say this cup has tea. Okay. Now I drink up all the tea. So what does this cup now have? Nothing. It has only void. It has air. Maybe I take out the air and I create a void in it. Then. Stay with me, please. Then, as if I uncup this cup, maybe the container is also undone. So, if I uncup this cup, what happens is I get a void, and then I pour myself into this void. That is the negative capability. Okay. So now Keats and his poem, the poet and the poetry, the I and the we, the I and the God. The smaller eye and the bigger eye, the greater eye, they have all become one. So that's it for Keats. Thank you so much for listening. Hope to see you soon. Stay well, stay happy. And if there are any questions, please put them in the comment section. I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you so much.